All right, ladies and gentlemen, sports fans from around the world, welcome to Cricket for Americans. Nick here. Gabe. And we are recording episode two for the test. Now, this is not going, or yeah, episode two for test. This is not going to be posted the same day we're recording it. When, when I posted the test, episode one, we recorded that night and we posted it late that night. And the response we got has been fantastic. Gabe did such a fantastic job taking the solo reins on that review. As I mentioned in that one, I was going to sit back and relax and watch the master at work, and he did not let us down. And there were some comments in the comment section that said, you know, Nick, how come we didn't add more? You know, we like when both of you guys talk. And I love to talk in these videos just as much as anyone else. But when you see greatness in front of you, why would you want to stop it? Now, <laughs> if greatness happens again, I'm going to stand in front of the train. I'm going to stop it because I got to get my, you know, my two cents in there. But, you know, Gabe did a great job. We're excited to record this. We're not going to post it as soon as the last one. But it's by popular demand. Gabe gave me a call, so we got to do episode tonight so we can get on there pretty soon. So just keep that in mind. If there's a video you want so bad, we do listen to you. You know, uh, it, you know, and we kind of explained it to the fact that you had already done a review, so it was just really my thoughts on it, and I didn't want to be influenced by your thoughts, so that's kind of like why I was just getting out my review on it. But you know, again, your your, your audience called for you. You know what I'm saying? Your audience I, called I, for you. I, I you doubt know? that was it. And they wanted to hear you hear your thoughts. You know, man. Fans of this show, I mean, it is, I understand why everybody's like, I can't wait till our tinge was like episode two. I can't wait for it. You know what I'm saying, bro? Because it's awesome. Yeah, exactly. And it is absolutely a riveting show. You know, we were having a, a, a conversation things that the show doesn't discuss like for instance before we even got on air we're like you know i saw the entire uh, show i'm re-watching episodes now before we we record just to stay fresh so as, as are you and one of the things that you know at the end of episode one and moving into episode two they never explain steve smith got suspended and i'm like nick that doesn't even make sense he's not a bowler he's not all rounder and nick being who he is nick's not gonna walk into a, a a discussion without doing the research i'm the guy that just i shoot from the hip you know what i mean nick is gonna do the research he's gonna well, do let the me work. stop you right there i'm gonna be really rude and interrupt you real quick i just got an idea we were actually recording our little conversation what if we did marl style wait till the end of the video I'm going to add extra bonus footage at the end of the video to show, <laughs> highlight some of that conversation. And you're going to get unedited, unfiltered, our just conversation. Our, these are the things that we talk about when we're not recording. Let's add that to the end. But he's like he's talking about, he asked the question, how come Steve Smith got suspended? There was enough information to test on that. I'm going to include that conversation at the end. So wait till the very end of the video and you'll be able to get that conversation. Wait a minute. The camera was rolling for that? <laughs> <laughs> that just tells you how much attention I pay, bro. You, you only picked your nose twice, so you're good, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then let's just jump into episode let's jump two. Into it. The ep this episode title is Trust in the Plan, and that's a great episode title. I'm telling you, this show, besides the cricket, besides the access we get, besides these awesome real-life characters, and this has got to be one of the most real reality show documentaries out there. I know it's a do documentary, but this is some real characters. Besides all of that, I love the technical issues of this show. And in this episode, they must have used the best, high, most expensive 4K camera because when you're getting interviews with these guys, you are getting every – it's way better than what you're seeing right now on our cameras. I mean, it's – it's awesome. You are getting the best parts of these conversations in the locker room. And I just want to start off with that. And even the titles of the episodes are just so wonderfully done. So this is the beginning of test cricket for Australia for this series. They are going to play Pakistan first. They're going to play them in Dubai. And what's funny is before I watched this show, I always thought Dubai was part of Pakistan. You see it in Fast and Furious. You see the big towers. You see this. No, it's in um, UAE, right? And I was kind of surprised by it. That's very close to Pakistan, but right, they're right, playing right. Pakistan in UAE, in Dubai, and it's super hot. But we find out a little more about um, the captain, Tim Payne. He, this is his first chance. You know, he's that new pup. And a little bit halfway through the episode, you see he gives like a little PowerPoint presentation when he's talking about the values of the test team for Australia. We're going to move forward. This is what we're going to be about. And he talks a lot about, you know, let's um, – how's he put – he said, let's 
act like the cricket team the entire time. Let's show our values. Let's show who we are, whether we're having a beer with a friend after a match, whether we're at home or whatever. Let's show who we are and let's respect ourselves enough so that we, he didn't say this, but so that we don't fall down the similar road of where we went down before. But you get to see his introduction to this. And I can't imagine the pressure on Tim Payne being the new captain, not just the scandal aftermath, but just the test team, the new captain. He's the wicketkeeper, obviously. And he's seen, and he's on, he's on camera too. I would not do well being a followed by a camera 24-7. I wouldn't be able to do that. Right. He seems like he was just ready to take over the reins as a captain. I still don't think he's the best player, the best hitter on the team but he shows that he's ready to take on that mantle. And that was one of the many cool things about this episode. You know, um, just to kind of piggyback on what you were saying there, uh, not just after that, this isn't like it's his first shot at, uh, uh, well, it is his first shot at being cap- at being captain, but they've already had, and we saw that in episode one, they've already had their first games with him as captain, and they didn't go well. They went to England and got shellacked, okay? They got shut out five nothing it was in it was embarrassment so he's still he's got all the pressure of the world you're right and then they're talking about probably who's become my favorite player on the team um Uzi Uzi is he is me okay and what I mean by that his demeanor is just like mine right <laughs> you he wish no, his, he, you know he walks to his own drum beat he's gonna he's outspoken he's gonna say what he wants to say but he plays for the team and he's passionate about what he does and one of the things he's right away, like, I'm not the guy. I was never the guy. And it got me in trouble many a times where they're like, oh, it's okay that I didn't get selected or and, and or it's okay. And I'm that way with my kids as well. If I'm better, I need to be selected. If I can play, you need to have me on there. And, and that's just me. I'm, and it gets me in trouble, you know, with my kids as well. Coaching in the past has gotten me in trouble where if there's, you know, true, true story. My oldest son, who's uh, now in college, when he was playing little league baseball, he was a shortstop. A better kid came along. Guess what? Benched him. You not, you're not the shortstop anymore. You're gonna have to go play me out there. It's merit, okay. Bottom line: if you're an athlete, it's about merit. And Uzi's like, I can play. And they told him, well, you need to lose some weight. You need to make a big, a, a bigger commitment to playing. And guess what? He didn't go ahead and pout or whatever. He said, all right, cool. And he took it on like a demon. He's going to do what I got to do to go on there and play, but I'm still going to be outspoken. And you saw that in the meeting where he's like talking to the to, to, to um uh, JL and he's like, look, I'm worrying so much about not getting out, getting out, getting out, that I'm getting out. Let me, let me play my way. Let me do things my way. And I love that he was so confident in his ability to perform the way he wants to. One of the things that drives me crazy, and you even see it in baseball, and I can only refer to baseball because I've coached at that level. I played also, you know, uh, uh, at the high school level, is that they want to make every single player the same. And it doesn't make sense. What works for me is not going to work for a guy that's 6'2", all right? I'm 5'8". It, it, it's different, you know what I mean? And But no, they want to teach the same mechanics, the same mechanics. Guess what? Your mechanics ain't going to work for me. I've been doing it my one way my whole life. This is what got me here. Let me do what I do. And we even saw that in the MS Doni film where, you know, he's been playing the way he plays aggressive his whole life. Don't come here and tell me not to be aggressive. This is what I do. This is what got me here. And I think that sometimes when someone's not an athlete, they don't understand that, which is why a lot of these new uh, um, era coaches who never played the game and they went to college and got their degrees in sports medicine and blah, 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 blah. And now they're coaching. Have you played a game? No. Did you struggle? Did you make it somewhere? No. So don't tell me what to do. I know what to do. I've been doing it all my life. And I think for any player in any sport, the most important thing, bro, is being um, A, confident and B, comfortable you've got to be comfortable you've got to be able to do it with, with, with it's got to be second nature you shouldn't have to think about your mechanics they should just come now to you if you're thinking too much about your mechanics which was uzi's point then while i'm thinking about not getting out because i got to do this and protect the wickets and do this and that, i'm getting out and i love that he stood up to jl and he spoke his mind and so jl let's, let's, respected it let's talk about that for a second so first of all i completely agree with you when i watched this my first way through um I loved Uzi 
He was probably my favorite. And then we get to see Tim or Steve Smith later on. And he was probably my second favorite. And we've, I've heard you talk about the same thing. So it's funny that we both connected to the same things. I was a huge JL fan as well. So that's, that's, that's pretty cool. But when I talked earlier about how this was Tim Payne's first one, they got destroyed in England. So this is his first big challenge as captain. When you're the brand new captain, you haven't started the job yet. Yeah. You can be as calm and confident as you want, but when you get punched in the face several times, what are you going to do now? Okay. It was great. We threw a party for you. We had the balloons, but now the balloons are all out. What are you going to do now? And so JL's approach was, you know, you guys just were not just, you know, you froze, you, you, you got way too hyped out and psyched out. We need to go to the basics. We're going to do in our training regiment. We're going to do hundred percent intensity. And if you get one out in practice, we're going to switch the whole rotation around. I know it's going to drive you crazy. You're going to hate having to do all that kind of stuff, but we're going to do it because we're going to protect these. And to your credit, you said Uzi eventually, and I appreciate him speaking up. That's tough to do, but him saying, you got us all worried about getting out that we're not playing our game. Now there's two sides to that coin. One side is, you know what? You're right. Go ahead. The reins are free. The reins are off. You go do what you got to do. But as a coach, you still have to be able to have your guys in preparation. You you can look at that as this guy is being honest and saying, I'm I'm getting too mental about this. Or you can look at it as this guy's kind of complaining a little bit. And he gave he gives him a great response instantly. He says, That's fine. But what are you going to do in a game when you get out right away? There's there's no you know, practice, there's no second chance. We've got to prepare and be able to have our way. And going to the end of the episode. You know, they had some great stuff that happened we'll talk about, but they, they you know, one step forward, two steps back. And so JL, he's getting into his own mind as a, as a cap, as a, as a coach trying to figure out and feel his way. But you got all these people who are given these opportunities that they may not have had because of the scandal and, and they're filling each other out. My question is how in the world have, do you have Uzi who's basically – on the on the bench this whole time he's not selected as one of the, the 12 guys or 11 guys that are traveling because this guy's a monster you have these other new guys you guys Labashane, you have head you have a few other guys and you know some of them you know show their worth especially Labashane later on in the series but he right. got a golden duck in this first game against pakistan i believe he did he didn't get any runs and i'm thinking you had uzi in the background you got all these guys called up this guy's one of the best but before we get there um, you know, they're playing against Pakistan, Pakistan. They let got me ask you a question. before we, before that thought leaves us, let me ask you the question because his, his biggest asset is also, and like most people, you know, your strongest virtue is also your strong, your, 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 your worst yeah, vice. Turn your weakness into a strength. And the problem with Uzi is he's too outspoken. I've experienced that myself. My son experienced that. And a lot of times coaches don't want to hear that. Here's the thing. These coaches for the, Bottom line is they all have ego. There's not a coach alive that does not have ego. Look at what's going on right now in the NFL with Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. Those guys could have stayed together and probably won another Super Bowl, gone on another run, make history that nobody else could make. But what's gotten into play there? Ego. Everyone has one, especially coaches. So I can guarantee you that uh, Uzi, this is not the cameras on that he's talking about. Oh, uh, 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 I play my way or whatever. No, that's how he is. And sometimes when you have that kind of personality, it rubs coaches the wrong way. And you really have to prove yourself. My son, for instance, Trey, he plays high school baseball, high school football. So he's always late entering the other camp and he misses a lot of camp. So for the most part, he he's on the bench the first se- uh, a game or two of the season. And although the coaches know he is one of the, and this is just not me talking, you know, he's one of the best players. No, 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 no question on the team. They don't, they can't stand the fact that he plays the other sports here in in America. Anyway, sports have become so uh, uh, centralized where if you're a football player, you're basically going to be playing football all season long. Then in the off season, you'll run some track, but they've got mini camps. It's baseball is pretty much all season long, especially since we live in Las Vegas and the weather allows it. And if you play the other sport and you miss all that off season stuff, it's going to be a battle for you to get back there. And I've seen these go- coaches like lose games basically because they don't have not just trainers, another kid that does the same, that are two of their best athletes. That's why they can play both football and baseball. But the rule is you cannot play unless you've gone to eight practices, which isn't going to happen if you play Legion baseball, because it comes up right into the beginning 
beginning of football season. And that's how it is, bro. And you, I guarantee you that that the reason Uzi, if they knew the talent, Jay Elvin says it. I've seen this kid play. He's got talent, but and his demeanor and his attitude and some yeah, people. And can't I don't it. know. We didn't get to see a lot of a a cancerous type vibe. He spoke out his way, but he wasn't shouting. He wasn't pointing fingers. The thing I really liked about him is he took all. Uh, he took you know his shoulder. He put that chip on his shoulder and he like cemented it on his shoulder. It's not going to come off. He's going to use it as fuel to move forward. And he says a few times in this episode, you know, they want us to do it a certain way. You know, when I go up to the bat, I, f- I feel like with my game, with my reverse, um, my reverse, I don't want to say it's not swing, my reverse sweeps and whatnot. That's a very risky thing to do in a test match. It's, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but I feel like my game's going to work against their style of spin bowling and of pace and whatnot. So, I'm going to do it. i got to play. i got to feel comfortable because, like you said, if you don't feel comfortable, you're no worth. You're not worth anyone. I like his attitude so far and in the entire series because he doesn't go too far. I just feel like – I mean, it could be a few things. I don't want to say politics or this or that, but, I, I mean, this guy can just straight out play. And if it's losing seven or eight kilos that makes a difference, then thank goodness he lost those seven or eight kilos. But, I mean, this guy is the man. So let's get into Pakistan before this is, like, a longer than the episode was, this review. And so they play Pakistan in the super hot heat and they start off the first test match, the first game, they start off way behind, like 480 or some nonsense like that. They're way, way behind and they're up to bat and it's like the second or third day or whatever. And they're trying to chip away. They only got like 220 runs in the 10 wickets. They got out pretty quickly. I think that's when Labashane got his golden duck. Um, You had different things going on, but, at, to make a long story short, they their biggest thing was if we can get this to a draw, if we can outlast that fifth day. Now, in test cricket, they have this rule where it's, first of all, it's 450 total overs. Think about that, 450 overs. That's nine ODI matches, for crying out loud. Right. You have about 90 overs a day, give or take, over the five days. If we can last the war of attrition, if we can go and not get our 10th wicket for in our second inning between, between before all those outs are, or those overs are done in the fifth day, then we don't get a loss. We get a draw. And it doesn't matter how many more runs Pakistan has, it's a draw because they have to beat us. And this whole idea, after I was watching it for a second time, I started thinking like, hold on, I'm missing something here. You have this idea of just outlasting. And yes, you can't get those other 10 outs. So it's 10, 20 total outs in your two innings. But I had this idea, and I want to ask the audience this. Is this why, one reason why you would um, declare or forfeit your innings? Because if your team is just racking in the runs, 500 runs, 600 runs, which is astronomical, obviously, in your inning. But if you're just in the zone and you're scoring all these runs, it's taking more time. It's taking more overs. It's taking more days. Do you declare at a certain point where you're like, if we're on this track, they're going to be able to draw with us by just outlasting because we're going to be hitting for two or three days. We're mm-hmm. not going to give them enough time for us to get them out. I want to know, is that this one of the strategic reasons to declare because you get that nice enough lead, but they still get their two innings. They still get their overs. We don't want them to draw with us. We don't want to get so full of ourselves that they end up drawing with us anyways. I'm curious if that's one of the reasons. If it is, then that makes a lot more sense to me. If it's not, then I'm still confused. But I, I thought that was interesting, the, the draw element. And they, they foreshadowed the beginning of this episode, and then you, you're left here with Tim Payne at the end of that fifth day. Just survive, Tim Payne, and we can make this happen. And he's on that cool partnership with Nathan Lyon, who's their spin bowler. You know, He's known for bowling. He's one of their best. And he's got to be in this batting partnership because there's basically no one left. Everybody and get out. Well, I, he didn't, I don't know. Did he get a half century? Or I don't know. Yeah, he, he got – he got a half century, and yeah. he barely picked up his bat. And even the announcer said, I don't think he's going to celebrate it because he knows what he has. And that's the little things of team. That's what makes him a captain. Because this guy in his mind is like, yes, I got a half century. It's nice I haven't got a half century in however no, many Nathan games. Line. Did Nathan Lyon get a half century? The bowler. No, no, no. no. Tim Payne got the half century and I, barely I lived Nathan up. Lyon, I mean, he was maybe a partnership in that half century. century. Right. He was a partnership in it. He was able to hold his own. Nathan Lyons probably maybe my third favorite guy. This guy's got some personality and whatnot. But, I mean, that was really, really cool. I mean, there's so many things I want to talk about. There's that. There's what happens next. 
Obviously, the baggy greens I mentioned in my review. I love the whole baggy green thing. Just the emotion of being able to get your first baggy green. They've been looking for this their whole life. You put that thing on and you go back in time 100 years. That was really cool. You know what? Uh, uh, we kind of skipped over that. And they had three new players that that, that um, made the team, basically. And the initiation, so to speak, and is is the baggy green. I don't know of anything in prof- in American sports that's – rival to the baggy green you know what i mean that ceremony and they make it a ceremony and i've never heard of that but it is so cool and i always think to myself man a lot of these kids in baseball who get called up from the minor league or a lot of these rookies in, in, in um in the nfl that come straight out of college and play their very first game like there should be something to commemorate that because you're joining an exclusive club. They even number the baggy greens. You're number 454. That was um you, not yeah, uh yeah. who did the lion give the hat to? He gave it to Head, um Travis Head. To Travis Head. He, your hat is number 454. That tells you you're part of a very exclusive group. You know what I mean? I'll tell you so, what, man. If I get a baggy green, I want number 476 because that's the lucky number from Dewar. I want that badge. <laughs> you know what I mean, dude? That, that's a good one. Um, but the baggy green ceremony was really cool, especially because usually it's legends that do it. And that's pretty cool. The legends come and get baggy green. But then you have Travis Head who said, you know what? When I first got on this team, you know, Nathan Lyon was more than just a teammate. He kind of mentored me. A lot of the older guys don't do that. And it's a tough, you know what I mean? Like, and then Nathan Lyon was choked up because he's like, this is for legends. And he's like, I thought I was going to be okay. And as he's doing the, the, the ceremony, head in the back of the room, he's crying, man. It was, Dude, he got it me was choked out, the little thing. punk. Yeah, you know what I mean? It was, it was, a, it was a beautiful thing, you know what I mean? But um, he got me choked up as well, so don't feel bad. I was like, that's a, that's a really cool thing. I, then I wanted one thing I want to talk about this episode is – the big risk that Uzi took because he gets out there and basically Australia uh, Australia has dug themselves a hole. But the night before, uh, just because Uzi has actually a really good uh, a partnership with Finch and they get them to the next day, coach says, listen, I would rather be us right now because nobody expects us to win down whatever it was, 450 runs, than them. They're expected to win. They've declared. Let's make them sorry that they declared. Nobody, there's no pressure on me, on us. The, all the pressure is on Pakistan. And I was like, you know what? He's right. Look, we're getting kicked. Our teeth kicked in in the newspapers. Nobody, we're, we're cheaters. We're the second stringers. We're this, we're that. Yeah, they're nobody, playing on the road. They say how hard it is to play on the road. As on the road. As nobody as expects us to go come in here and get this tie. So let's get this tie. Let's put the pressure on Pakistan. And they go out there. And like you said, first thing my man Uzi does, first ball, <laughs> reverse sweep. And even Aaron Finch says it takes some guts to do that because if you hit it at somebody and they catch it, guess what? You're going to catch some flack for that. Oh, that yeah, that's the kind of thing yeah. that could probably get you cut off the team or sent back down, you know, not put on the next roster to play the next test. But it works. And he says, you know what? I have to play my game. And he played his game. And this and guy. That, he didn't just go for the reverse sweeps, but I don't know if you noticed this, but when he was doing um, like the front foot hits, he was way past that line. His back foot was not anywhere near that line. He was doing those mm-hmm. few steps to get it, probably because it's it's a pace bowling or a spin bowling, so he wants to be able to match up to it. But that's yeah. a huge risk because if he whiffs, if he misses it, he's got a big, huge couple of steps back before the guy can just hit the wickets with it, the stumps right. with it. So, I mean, he was, he was putting all caution to the wind and said, let me show you what I can do. But that's his game. And then – even JL says, JL said that he said, this guy's a madman. He batted for nine hours. I repeat, nine hours. That's probably that Raven insane. territory right there. Mind you, they had been fielding prior. So it's not like they're he's fresh. They've already fielded. They've already played X amount of hours on the field, two days worth or whatnot, uh, on a uh, fielding. So this guy has to be exhausted. Nine hours. It was such an unbelievable performance. And Tim Payne, I don't know if he has said this, and let us know in the comments, but Tim Payne says in, in the video that that's probably the most unbelievable inning he's ever seen 
And Tim Payne has been around for a while. Australia has some really good players. So if he says that's the most unbelievable inning he's seen, you know, more than likely it's a special thing that Uzi was able to do. Nine hours? That's insane. You were, it's a war, like you said, not a race, it's a marathon. And he wore them out, but he wore them out with his aggressive style. And then finally, Tim Payne comes in to go ahead and cement the win. And as a captain should be, it was on his shoulders. And yes, I might have failed in England when we first got there, but I succeeded now. And I like one thing that Tim Payne even said. He said, you know, when I first got out here, I like the picture they had with him and with um, Steve Smith. And it's a really young him. You can tell he's bright eyed and bushy tailed. He's a rookie. He's got like the shaggy hair, whatever. And he says, yeah, I came. I played. I broke a finger. I got injured. I was out for seven test match. Like. Your career could be over just like that. This guy, you know, missed a large chunk of his career just on injuries. So he's valuing every single game because he realizes, like, these opportunities don't come around all the time. So I really like that aspect about it. But, you know, I just wanted to mention that about Uzi. That's what really made me my uh, 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 made him my favorite character. And I don't I want to say character. I mean player in the, in the test. The whole time. I kept thinking of Frank Sinatra's I did it my way. Copyright, of- copyright. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I sung it. Come on. Anyway, yeah. It doesn't exactly. matter, man. These people are crazy. <laughs> but that's what I was thinking the yeah. entire time. Dude, he went out there and he did it his way. And to his to his credit, JL gave him all the credit in the world and said, man, this guy was unbelievable. And we always knew he had talent. And he acknowledged, you know, okay, he proved me wrong. Do it your way. And, you know, we know we find out later on they put him at the top of the order because a guy, like you said earlier, is a monster. He can absolutely bat. And I think also, by the way, remember, JL just got to the team. Though The choice to not have Uzi on the team earlier probably wasn't his. He came in and inherited the team because there, were co- there was a coaching staff there before JL. So there was probably some friction between Uzi and the prior co- uh, coaching staff. Yeah. So I finally get a chance to talk. All right. This is nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you have that you have, I mean, the first few episodes follows this, this formula where, like I said before, one step forward, two steps back, this team really goes through it. It's not just a little bit of conflict and a whole lot of success. So they have the next test match in the series. And this time it's an odd. Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi. And they're playing against Pakistan again, and they start off awesome. I think they're they're bowling first, and they get five outs and only 50 runs. They're like, hey, we have finally arrived. This is awesome. And then they just get destroyed by Pakistan. And then they go up to the bat. They don't do too well. And then Pakistan goes up there to bat again, their second inning, and they destroy them more. I mean, they just got obliterated by them in the second game. And you see the frustration near the end of the episode where um, – near the end of the episode – where JL is just like, you guys choked. I mean, you guys were there. We had it awesome. And then we just got destroyed. We had a chance to beat them and draw, which meant they would have no chance to beat us in this series. And we just let it go away. And then he's focusing near the end. Let's focus on, on game three. Let's focus on this last test match. And think about that. I mean, you just survived one test match five days. And then you have another one. And then you have another. I mean, this is crazy how much they're playing and how exhausting that would be. But he's like, let's just focus on this last one. If we can survive and if we can get a win and we can still win the series against Pakistan, that would be awesome because Pakistan's no joke. We're kind of in shambles. We're still filling ourselves out. And we got some places to go that we need to. And then that's when you got Steve Smith trying to pump them up. I mean, not Steve Smith, but um, Tim Payne trying to pump them up as the as the captain. And you have the other players saying, yes, we've got we to focus on this. We've got to get this taken care of. And unfortunately, it's just, it just doesn't go their way. And it's just – it's heartbreaking when you watch the show because you think they're going somewhere, and then they just get destroyed and obliterated. And not that we are Team Australia, but you root for Australia as you're watching the show about them because you see all right. the challenges they go through. And to see them just trip up time and time again, it's almost like your little brother tripping up in, in the game and you just want to go over there and give them a hug or you just want to go there and bat for them and hit a, a few home runs so that you can help them out. But man, it's tough to watch sometimes. And, and you know, was one of, one of the f- funny things I was thinking about uh, while I was just talking about 
of the things where cricket mirrors baseball very much in two aspects. A, it's a war of attrition because, like you said, it's game after game after game after game. And in, 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 in cricket, it's, you know, like you said, test after test after test. So they've got so much work to put in. You can't even celebrate one victory because you got to worry about the next victory. And they come off of this high of getting this 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 draw that nobody thought they were going to get to then go and get their teeth kicked in again and that's one thing here's another thing the thing about cricket just like baseball is that and it, it comes back to bite you so many times there's no clock okay you have to get those outs. There is no uh, 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 in basketball. It drives me crazy at the end of the game with all the fouling and bleeding the clock. In football, the the same thing. You know, in soccer, it's almost egregious in soccer how often. And that, as you know, my wife's family, like I you, I've mentioned before, they're all soccer royalty and pro players. They love. I don't think soccer. we've had a video in the last two weeks where you haven't mentioned soccer royalty. <laughs> and it drives me crazy because I tell them, bro. The end of a of a soccer game, especially if a team has a lead, is it is it's they're just trying to draw the thing out, bro. They're trying to bleed that clock. And the clock drives me crazy because there's something almost not sportsmanlike about not giving the other team team a chance, if that makes sense. But bro, in baseball, you gotta get those 27 outs. And in, 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 in test cricket and even in um um the T20, there's that set amount that no matter what you do, like you said, the other team. We still have a shot, okay? We have a shot. You're not just going to bleed the clock and dominate it. We have a shot to come back. And we saw that play in their favor, right, in the first get, in the, in, in, yeah, in the first test match when Uzi went up there for nine hours. Yeah, they had this insurmountable uh, uh, lead. Um, And we're talking about Pakistan. Guess what? We still get a chance to bat. We still get a chance to come out here. And it worked out for Australia. And you get Nathan Lyon, who gets three outs. And I remember this right away. He has three wickets with zero runs, five with 50, like you said. You think, oh, my gosh, this thing, he's bowling unbelievable. But guess what? They still got a wicket, and it got ugly after that. So, I mean, you know, it's one of those situations where that's why I like the purity of, of, of cricket and, and we had a subscriber talk about how, you know, test cricket is the, the real form of cricket because it's that war of attrition and, 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 you know, batters have to be out there and playing for, you know, a very long time. And, you know, now with the T20, there's, you know, you, you, you only allowed one bounce, uh, one bouncer per over. And, you know, there's things to that can be said about how, uh, which, which one, which form of the game it is more enjoyable. But the point is, at the end of the day, it gives you that competitive uh, a balance where the other team gets a shot and it's not like they can just bleed the clock. Like, I'm sure as a Chargers fan, this has happened to your football team where your, your team just needs the ball, but the other team is bleeding the clock or in basketball. or in, And I hate that concept. That's why I love that you have to get that last out concept. You know what I mean? Yeah, so... I hope you enjoyed our thoughts on episode two. We covered most of it. If we didn't, um, we would be much longer than this. But <laughs> we, we hope you enjoyed our thoughts. We, uh, we're we going to continue with episode three. The next chance we get, it may not be as soon as this one came out from episode one, but you never know. We'll see what our schedule is like. If you have not seen the test, what's wrong with you? Go check it out. If you have, then check out episode three on your own so that when you come back for our review in a few days, hopefully you'll be able to have, you know, that fresh in your mind. Don't forget also to subscribe to cricket for Americans. I think most of you watchers have not subscribed to just click that button. Show us that love. Don't forget to like and, and uh, comment in the comment section below. Look out for other videos and discussions we have coming. And as always until next time, that's six runs. Why did Steve Smith get uh, uh, suspended? He wasn't a bowler. He's not an all-rounder. Why did he get suspended? Simply because he was the captain of the team? I don't know. Let's look it up real quick. I would it's assume he had something to do with it, and they didn't go into detail on that, but I'm not sure. Did I miss that in the show? Because they don't go into detail why he got suspended. No, they don't. So if it was ball all. tampering, why would he be suspended? That don't make sense. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, let's find out. Why was Steve Smith suspended? 
Cape Town. Um, uh, let's see. One thing says that he just took the blame as the captain, but it's it's got to be more than that. Let's see. Um, shed further light on his role in the ball tampering scandal in South Africa, meaning he did not want to know about it when the plan was being hatched. He was banned for 12 months, said he let himself down by not trying to stop something from happening when he saw David Warner and Cameron Bancroft in a discussion of the dressing room in Cape Town. I walked past something and had the opportunity to stop it, and I didn't do it. Oh, it sounds like the former head coach, the Houston Astros. Well, I mean, that right there is tough because what was he supposed to do right then and there, rat his people out? As a captain, you've got to be able to have the wherewithal to stop it. Like, no offense, but if I had someone on my grade level that was cheating on SBAC, I, w- I would stop it. I'd say, first of all, you put me in this impossible position because you knew right. what you were doing, and now I've got to rat you out, and now i you know, you've got to make me feel uncomfortable by ratting you out, but you put yourself and put me in this position. So, I mean, it, it's different if like someone's like five minutes late to work. That's a different situation. But as right. you know, you know, testing in in whatever you want to call it infringement, that's a serious. That's that's a fireable offense. If you no, if you get course. caught up in that, then I have no love for you. Adios. And and I agree, but I just was like trying to rack my brain through it because I rewatched episode two. I caught a little bit of episode one in the recap, and I'm like, wait a minute, why was Steve Smith suspended? He wasn't a bowler, okay? Obviously, he's not an all rounder. He's not a bowler. He the offense. Why was he suspended? Simply because he's the captain of the team. Okay, so now I understand. He knew about it. You did the research. He knew about it, but. Man, you're in an impossible position. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. If you ride them out, you're a snake, okay? No one on that team will ever trust you again. And you got to go back to other situations in sports where, you know, you you know that locker room, it, it, it's almost like holy holy ground. You know what I'm saying, dude? You you What happens in the locker room stays in the locker room. Think about the Kobe and Sack situation, a whole bunch of other situations. But see, where- that's different because neither of them are doing anything illegal. Neither of them are doing anything for a, a competitive advantage. It's all I, ego right there. But if you I, have I if you have 